good morning everybody today we are get together here for one day international conference organized by a e kalsekar degree college affiliated to mumbai university accredited by nac with a grade today on date 24th april 2024 we are here for participating presentation of the ppt in today's one day international conference organized by kashikar college thane mumbai maharashtra india total two articles have been received from out of india that is nigeria and thailand rest total to uh, 180 article it is received for today's international conference the conference articles will be published in peer review international journal as well as booking chapter in international publisher we thanks to kalshekar college for giving the tender for marketing organization of today's international conference as well as publication thanks especially to kashikar sir nasreen madam and trustee principal of the kashikar college sri wagmani brothers always helps to make the conference successful marketing in india and abroad this is an initiative for betterment of higher education and support to the research scholar of phd as well as the research scholar of the th final year of mcom msc preparation for dissertation and projects this is a golden opportunity for research methodology to all our participation and presentation of the ppt i would like to start the conference with our national anthem janaganaman i would like to request all the participants please stand up for our national anthems janaganaman please wait गैस बुक कर अरे thank you please sit down we are the indian the national anthem we just listen we get automatically better qualities for announcement the education of i would like to hand over the all session water padra sir you busy na hello i would like to hand over the all session to respected uh, nasreen madam and sanjay sir sanjay kalsekar sir sir please hand over you i am making the host to you thank you may i request this uh, 
participant prabhakar rao to please mute yourself prabhakar rao please mute yourself i once again request you sir to please mute yourself uh, good morning dear all honorable management of darul rehmat trust esteemed guests distinguished delegates participants from overseas bangmare private management limited and all my colleagues on behalf of darul rehmat trust a kalsikar degree college hi mr sanjay shram kalekar iqc coordinator and the co convener of this conference take great pleasure and utmost honor to extend a warm welcome to our chief patron honorable mr ahmed maglai sir all our trustees of darul rehmat trust respected guest dr jenis fernandes madam respected dr abhijit kerkar sir respected dr rajendra kumar sir respected dr kinari thakkar madam and of all the participants to this prestigious international multidisciplinary conference organized by research day and ipc of our college today we are gathered here from all corners of the representing diverse cultures perspectives and expertise all united by the first college collaboration and this conference serves a platform for intellectual exchange where innovative ideas are conceived debated and nurtured it is a testament to the power of unity diversity and cooperation in driving positive change on a global scale darul rehmat trust a kalsikar degree college has been instrumental in organizing such conferences every year over the next few hours we can engage for provoking discussion their insights and for meaningful connections that transcend borders and from scientific breakthroughs to socio economic challenges from technological advancements to environmental sustainability to socio economic challenges to technological advancements and environmental sustainability the topics we will explore as varied as they are crucial to shaping the world we inhabit as we embark on this journey together let us approach it with open minds and receptive hearts let us commit to ourselves to fostering an environment of mutual respect understanding and collaboration where every voice is heard and every contribution is valued once again on behalf of our college research sale and iqc i extend my warmest welcome to each one of you before we actually begin this program and the felicitation of guests i hereby request dr sajid ali sir recite the verses from holy quran over to you sajid ali sir hello am i audible yes sir. hello yes sir a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim wal asri innal insana lafi khusr illa alladhina amanu wa 'amilu s-salihati wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bis sabr sadaqallahu alazim jazakum to begin with further program i hand over the session to mrs parinta kumari madam over to you madam thank you so much sir am i audible yes sir okay good morning everyone i parinita kumari on behalf of research committee and iqac extend my warm welcome to our esteemed guests of honor honorable chairman mr ahmed maklai sir honorable vice chairman mr sadik k hawa sir honorable treasurer dr mohammad khalil memon sir honorable secretary mohammad mr haji rehmatullah patel sir honorable managing trustee mohammad farid zariwala sir honorable joint secretary mr abdullah patel sir and honorable trustee mr iqbal virani sir who all have played a pivotal role in making this international research conference a reality your vision 
leadership and unwavering support have been instrumental in shaping this event into a platform that fosters collaboration, innovation, and knowledge exchange among researchers from all around the world. With immense pleasure, I would also like to welcome our three keynote speakers for today's conference. Dr. Janice Fernandez from University of West London, UK. Dr. Rajendra Kumar from University of Pune, Dr. Abhit Sheet Kelkar from University of Pujaira, United Arab Emirates. I would also write, like to extend my warm welcome to our conference director, our principal, Dr. Sadi Thundekar Sir, convener of research committee, Dr. Nasreen Kolar, ma'am, co convener and IQAC coordinator, Mr. Sanjay K Kalekar Sir, organizing secretary. Dr. Sajid Ali sir, Vice Principal of Self Finance, Dr. Farzana Chavri ma'am, Vice Principal of Commerce and Arts Aided Section, Dr. Zahid Ansari sir, Vice Principal of Science, Mrs. Anjuman Siddiqui ma'am. I feel privileged and honored to extend my warm welcome to all the participants from all over the world who have joined us for today's conference. DRTA Kalsekar Degree College is scaling new heights of success and no event would have been possible without his support and guidance. So with great pleasure, I would like our organizing secretary, Dr. Sajid Ali sir, to read the message sent by our honorable chairman, Mr. Ahmed Maklai sir. Please sir, Sajid sir. Okay, thank you. Good morning. I, Dr. Sajid Ali, would like to read the message of Honorable Chairman Sir of DRT's Trust to you all. Good morning, everyone. I am delighted to welcome you all to this one-day online international disciplinary conference organized by the Research Committee and IQAC of DRT's A.E. Kalsekar Degree College. DRT's A.E. Kalsekar Degree College provides purposeful and holistic education that incorporates spirituality. We believe that spirituality enhances the beauty of the heart and foster clarity of mind and enriching the lives of our students. We view college as more than just an educational institution. It is a transformative phase that shapes the futures of our students. During their time here, a student embark on a journey of self-discovery, honing and refining their critical thinking. Our college fostered a dynamic environment where diversity is celebrated, ideas are freely exchanged, and personal and intellectual boundaries are continuously expanded. We take pride in our institution's reputation for providing excellent education and instilling discipline in our stakeholders, preparing them to face future challenges with confidence. I extend special greetings and best wishes to all the teaching and support staff, the research committee, and the IQAC for organizing this conference. Conferences such as these are invaluable platform for academic and professional development. They bring together experts, researchers, and enthusiasts from diverse fields to exchange knowledge, explore innovations, and collaborate on cutting edge ideas. Participating in conference allows us to broaden our horizon, keep abreast of the latest trends, and expand our professional networks with like-minded individuals. Presenting at conferences offers a unique opportunity to showcase our research and receive constructive feedback from peers and experts. And it sharpens our presentation skill, boosts our confidence, and cultivates qualities that are essential for any career path. In conclusion, both our college and the conference are a pivotal platform in our educational and professional journeys. They provide fertile ground for intellectual and personal growth, encouraging 
us to challenge ourselves to strive and strive for excellence. Let us embrace these opportunity opportunities wholeheartedly and actively participate in in each and reaching experience they offer. Thank you all for your attention and participation. And I wish each of you a fulfilling and in and and reaching college experience and reached further by an engaging conference. Thank you. Over to you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you so much, Sajid sir, for reading this message. Though our honorable chairman, Mr. Ahmed Maklai sir, is not here with us today, but his words of wisdom radiated a source of energy within us. We always need your blessing, sir. Thank you so much for this message. Now, I would like to request our principal, sir, to enlighten us with his words. Please, sir. Hello. I am audible. Yes, sir. You are audible. Yes. Good morning. Wagmari Brothers, management of DRT, participants and experts from India and abroad. And my teaching staff members of DRT's A. Kalsikar Degree College on the occasion of one day online international multidisciplinary conference on the pivotal role of multidisciplinary research in hastening the new education policy 2022 uh, 2020 across various disciplines organized by the research committee and IQAC. About my college, DRT's A. Kalsekar Degree College was started in the year 2020, uh, 2001 by Darul Matras at Kausa with the Faculty of Arts and Commerce and the Faculty of Science was introduced in 2004 and 5. Mm -hmm. The college has a beautiful campus with a very spacious buildings and state-of-art infrastructure. It is well known for its quality education and excellent academic results and social commitments. There was no college in the predominantly minority population of Kausa Mumra. Students of this area face difficulties in getting admission to the colleges, which were mostly situated in the Thane and Mumra area. Moreover, they have to face painful commuting by overcrowded trains. Many female students have to drop out the college due to the lack of facilities for higher education in the locality. This lacuna was overcome by the establishment of this college and the commencement of this college in 2001 was the realization of a dream of the selfless and dedicated trustees. The college is presently aggregated with a grade by NAC uh, with the C, uh, CGPA of 3.25. Thanks. I hope this conference will be enlightened for everyone. And uh, congratulations to all team. Best of luck. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you so much, sir, for your endless guidance, motivation, and support always. Moving ahead. Now, I would like to call upon our co-convener and IQAC in charge, Mr. Sanjay Kaleka, sir, to say a few words. Please, sir. Uh, good morning, sir, to all of you. Hearty welcome to all of you to this multidisciplinary conference. Uh, I.K. Kalsikar's uh, IQAC and research committee has been playing an instrumental role in bringing out such activities across college, both the same and the IPC is quite active in bringing out quality enhancement, quality initiatives across the institution and apart uh, the institutional outreach activities too. I once again welcome all of you all uh, on behalf of college, hotel and IPC and wish you all Thank you so much. More to you. Thank you, sir. Your proactive approach to maintain a high standard has greatly contributed to overall academic reputation. Thank you so much, sir. Once again, I would like to thank 
to all the guests of honors and all the participants on the busy schedule graced us with their presence. Now progressing further, but before starting that, I would request everyone to please mute yourself. Man, yeah, okay. Now I would request all our distinguished guests and participants to please join me in extending a warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Dr. Janice Fernandez from London, United Kingdom. She's academic support librarian in University of West London, UK. Ma'am has a rich experience of 31 years. Quality control, information literacy, innovative techniques in librarianship, human resources are her area of specialization. Her key skills include dynamic and proactive in customer service and interpersonal skills, proficient in use of changing ICT, competency with various library software and knowledge of working digitally, and many more. She has received two best paper awards in year 2014. Ma'am has been awarded People's Manager for the year Vance Worth Libraries in October 2018. She has published numerous research papers in various journals since 2008. Some of her publications include Impact of Accreditation on Engineering College Libraries in Mumbai with regard to infrastructure, published in International Journal of Library and Information Science. Public Library Service in UK, a vision for future published in Polish Library Management and again many more. She was a keynote speaker for topics like ICT and higher education, preparation of PhD synopsis in social sciences and humanities discipline, etc. She has made significant career achievements and condensing her notable career achievements into this brief summary is really challenging for me. So without any further delay, I would request Dr. Janice Fernandez, ma'am, to please take the lead. Please, ma'am. Thank you so much, Parinita, for that uh, lovely introduction. I, I hope I will live up to that. And My a pleasure, very, thank you, a Only very... Madam. Uh, a very good morning to all of you from cold and chilly London. It is five degrees here today and I'm sure you are all enjoying the warmth of the weather and the mangoes of the season. Something that we always long for in this part of the world. Uh, let me begin by sharing my screen. Is my screen visible? Yeah, yes, it is visible. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, the topic that I'm going to speak about today, I think, is something that uh, all of us are talking about in different parts of the world. We are talking about AI tools in various uh, sectors, strongly in medicine, a lot in humanities, a lot in research, uh, a lot in the educational field. And while we are very wary of what AI can do, we also need to be aware of what AI can't do or sh we should not tell AI to do. So I've put this uh, small presentation together uh, and I'm looking at exploring the potential of AI while understanding the outcomes. One of the things that I just noticed when I got on this call this morning is if you look at the toolbar of uh, this uh, application, uh, I can see the first, uh, uh, the first icon says mute. It says stop video, participants. I'm sure all of you are following me in looking at 
that toolbar at the bottom of your screen. And there is something which says AI companion. Now, that was definitely not there in many of the other sessions that I have done with Dr. Kishore. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kishore, for this opportunity. Uh, thank you to uh, the trust, uh, to the college, and to all of the people involved in the organization of this conference. And uh, thank you for this insight. When I look at this AI companion, I now realize that we have come a long way. So I hope you would all look at these uh, small things. As a student of research, both me and all of you participants, I am going to begin with a very basic introduction of research. So we define research as the creation of new knowledge. And that's what we are thinking of AI as the creation of new knowledge. But is AI really new? When you play those games on your mobile, oh, I love to play Candy Crush. And I'm sure a lot of you might play some Vertex or Scrabble of some of the other things. All that has existed from a really long time. So... Uh, let's look and really think how new is AI. So let's look at a very simple basic definition of AI. So artificial intelligence. What do we mean by artificial? So when we say artificial, it is that which is made by human beings. In the context of computers, actually human beings are creating systems or software to look as though it's artificial. You need to remember that at the end of the whole thing, who inputs the data into the computers? It is a human being. It is a software engineer. It is a team of people. So how artificial is artificial is something to think about. So it is the science of making machines that can think like humans. The development of computer systems capable of performing tasks that typically require human-like cognitive abilities. We come back to this question of how old or new is artificial intelligence? When did it really originate? Uh, I looked a little at the history and somewhere around the 1950s, when we didn't even know, really know computers that well, uh, there were lots of these things happening. So there was a computer scientist called Arthur Samuel, who in 1952 developed a program to play checkers. And it was the first time that you could play, a human could play against a machine. I have a question for you all. I have a question for you all. What was the name of the IBM supercomputer that defeated world chess champion Gary Kasparov? Uh, I'm sure you all have uh, answers and I'm sure some of you uh, remember some of these uh, incidents that happened a long time ago. So the name of the computer was Deep Blue and that was developed by ABM in 1997. And uh, some of you would probably remember the background to such a large event in the history of computing when a human and a machine played a game against each other. So actually, the way that the coding was done, it evaluated 200 million chess positions per second and selected the best one. When we talk about AI today and when we say chat GPT can write a CV for you or chat GPT can write a 2000 word essay for you, you need to remember that the base of it actually comes from here, from a long time ago. So why is artificial intelligence important? 
I've just put together a few things and this actually comes from my base of librarianship but also comes from the need of the information society today. So today, as you all know, we have too much information, too little time. If I need to go from point A to point B, I will just search on my mobile and I will have probably four best options and I can select from that. Uh, there are lots of other things like language complexities uh, and of course, decision-making skills. <laughs> Is this the best option for me? The thing that I would like to say is, you need to remember the bottom line that computers trained by humans can often do things quickly and more efficiently than humans. Uh, always remember that AI is written by a human, even though it might be a machine which is analyzing and pulling out data for you and helping you in your decision-making process, the person who's put the data into the machine in the first place is still human. I put lots of terms here on the screen uh, just to see. I don't know how many of these are familiar to you. Have you heard of anything called Sophia other than the name of a girl? Have you heard of things called BARD? Do you know hallucinations in any other field other than psychology or medicine? Have you heard of things like Quillbot? Some things are familiar to you. If you look at the bottom of my screen, you have Microsoft Bing, which has got search and a chat uh, you've seen this thing called, hello there, can I help you find something? If you go on any banking site, if you go on any shopping site today, you will always have, how can I help? Oh, these are all interconnected. Chatbots are all uh, okay, what's now. available to you today. Let me keep the uh -huh. AI aside for a bit and come back to the research cycle. Just to remind uh, students and researchers of the basic steps in a research cycle. So when you are doing some research, you are first selecting a topic. You are reviewing what literature is available, what other people have done on it. You are then selecting your research methodology. What am I going to do now? How am I going to find out? Is this the best mode of travel? Are there other options? What else can I do? And when you have done your research and you have collected your data, you've spoken to people, called up people, written to them, interviewed them, you then collect your data, you analyze your data. Uh, whatever way you might use in analyzing your data. When you reach to a PhD level, you probably use uh, large things like SPSS or Tableau or Excel or R. On a much smaller scale, you might use simple, uh, simple tools as well. When you analyze your data, you interpret them and then you come to some conclusion. Your research cycle is not complete unless the results of your research go out into society and benefit others. Uh, this is the base of research. So remember when you do something, if you do not put it out there on uh, open uh, source software, if you do not put it out there on the internet, if you do not print it in conference papers, in conference um, uh, as an abstract or as a full text in your proceedings, which is also part of what we are doing today. You are going to publish your paper into a conference. If you don't do this, then it is uh, it doesn't complete the research cycle. So let me begin by saying, how do you select a research topic? I will have just put together an example, but you start from a very broad topic and then you go narrow and narrow and narrow. We are all aware of, uh, you could replace TikTok with any other social media, but uh, this is how you would actually go down narrower and narrower. Mapped to the research cycle, 
is how I have tried to put together some AI tools which are important or which I sort of put together. So Gemini, or you might call it Gemini, is the one developed by Google, which was earlier called Bard. You could just go and type Gemini. You could uh, log in there. You could register there and then try and see how it helps you. Obviously, because it is a Google tool, it brings out everything that is stored in Google. There are other things like consensus, which gives you summarized conclusions from research studies. There is Skype for scientific uh, citations. The good old chat GPT, which is something I think that students use extensively, which I have used myself and I have found it good in a number of ways. Something that we at the University of West London support and are pushing for students is Copilot. That's Microsoft uh, 365 application and it helps you with uh, your content creation. In fact, if you go on to Bing, simultaneously Copilot launches and asks, how can I help you? What are you looking for? Uh, things like that. So it's like your assistant, which is always there over your right shoulder. However, some things to think about. Uh, even though Gemini's coding is supposed to be the best, but there are lots of other things that we need to remember. Chat GPT's free version only has data up to January 2022. We are now in April 2024. So if you are asking for updated information, you are a little old in chat GPT. Also, <laughs> even though we say that these AI tools are free, they are not really free. A lot of them make you to pay month on month. Sometimes they will take in your card details and they will not tell you when your trial period is over and your pay period starts. So you might not use it, but your bank account might be debited by uh, this month on month. So things to think about. Let's look at the next one. That's the AI tools in the review of literature. So review of literature is literally that you would go on Google and you would search for something. But you would go on to more authentic websites. So how do you collect all of this? Uh, if you just go on to Google and if you search something, say, for research methodology in medicine or in the, uh, say, for uh, newer uh, research in diabetes or in blood cancer, you might get 46,452 search results. A bit too much. And how are you then going to sift through this to find authentic results? You may not want videos. You may not want... Uh, different types of uh, formats of information. So here are some tools. There is SkySpace. There is Research Rabbit, which is really good. There is Iris AI. And uh, Humata is something that I have used and I like because it summarizes the findings from long papers. So if there is a research uh, article in, uh, say, Sinal database, and it has got uh, 12 pages. You don't have to read those 12 pages because Humata will summarize it for you in a paragraph. It also compares documents. So it will probably tell you that there are four other documents which have got research uh, of the same type. And it can compare that for you. Now, that is a lot of work being done by the system for you. So you just have to tell the system the topic of your research and amazingly, it will do it for you. It will do all of this work for you. Uh, you can think of how much time you would save and how many more research papers you would submit uh, to conferences, uh, proceedings uh, or uh, seminars if you use these tools. That is what we think. However, there are things to think about. 
Humata only allows you 60 journal article pages and 100 questions each month. There are various other ways that various other tools uh, do stuff for you. Uh, is it really as authentic as it looks? Uh, do you think that there is a machine which could think like you and do exactly the way you did and summarize the research results? Let's see as we go along. So in the research cycle, as I mentioned about the data collection and the data analysis. So for example, if you were doing a research to find out say how many people uh, use the metro services in Mumbai. You might interview 500 people. You might interview 5,000 people. How will you analyze this data? How will you put all this together? Uh, will you enter it manually in Excel? Here are some tools to help you. Uh, Julius AI analyzes your structured data, uh, probably it pulls it out from forms. What we do here is uh, we use Microsoft Forms and Microsoft Forms automatically dumps your data into an Excel sheet and you can put some formula and you can analyze that. But some of these uh, AI tools like say Microsoft Power BI, which is a really powerful tool uh, something like polymer or akio akio is aimed at beginners and it's a business analytics and forecasting tools uh, i've used it a bit and i find it is good especially say for students who are doing who are studying say finance or business and uh, some of their assignments may say what do you forecast uh, do you think that this company will work in the UK, unfortunately, today, so many large corporations are closing down their stores. Uh, things like Debenhams, things like Wilco, uh, so many of these, even, even uh, our shopping uh, like Iceland uh, is closing down stores. And a lot of the assignments for students are actually this forecasting of what's happening to the economics. Akio does help at least at a beginner level, to analyze or understand some of these things. The good part about AI tools is you can ask it very specific questions. For example, if you asked me to write an essay, I would write an essay like a PhD scholar because that's what I am. But you can ask an AI tool to explain this problem step by step to me like a teacher or write an essay like a first year undergrad student and automatically the AI tool will change the language, the style, the choice of words depending on what you have asked it to do, which is amazing, isn't it? It also does these complex things like say you might ask for an ANOVA analysis or uh, something more co complex. You might put in maybe uh, people's income levels and you might ask uh, what's the trend of these people getting a loan from the bank? Uh, what's the analysis of it? Maybe in five years time, some sort of complex things are done by AI, which is amazing. If you look at the right hand, my right hand of the screen, you will see some images. And I pulled these out from a software which says, if Alexander the Great lived today, and if he lived in the UK, what would he look like? And they have done some analysis and said maybe the color of his hair would look like that and the color of his eyes would look like that. And his jawline would be that way. The same way with Napoleon Bonaparte. But you can try this for various other figures. Uh, and you can sort of check. We are looking now at AI tools which are useful for data visualization. 
images and photos. So often, after you have analyzed your data, you might want to present it in the form of a graph, maybe a pie chart, a bar graph, or, or you might want to include images and photos in your uh, research paper to make it more authentic. So where do you get the images from? Remember, if you pull out images from Google and do not uh, acknowledge them, do not acknowledge the source, then you are violating copyright. We have had some really huge cases both in the UK and in the US where people come back to you and say, hey, actually, that's my image. That's my photograph that I clicked of the sun or the sea of the flowers. You cannot use it. If you use it, we take you to court. You need to remember that without acknowledgement, you cannot just pull off images and use them. You might think, oh, it's just my presentation. No one's going to look at it. But no, it stays somewhere. And obviously, the way the system is designed, they probably know who's pulling it out. Okay. So some of the AI tools useful for data visualization are AI image generator. I like that one. Photo is also a really nice one. Uh, it removes the background for you. It maybe enhances your photograph and your photo effects. I'm sure all of you who post pictures on social media, especially selfies, Probably use some sort of a tool like this without really realizing it, isn't it? There is that, uh, that bit which can make your face look maybe brighter, glow better, maybe make your smile look different, maybe remove all those uh, funny friends in the background who were putting out fingers above your head. You can do a lot of these things with simple things like a photo generator. But obviously, AI goes a little bit further. There's a software called Chroma, K-H-R-O-M-A, which learns your color preference. So it asks you to select 50 colors and then it will always use those 50 colors. So maybe if you don't like gray or you don't like fluorescent uh, green, it will not use those colors in your palette. So things to think about, things to understand the advantages or the advances of AI tools today. Well, it's constantly learning and it's growing, isn't it? And we humans are teaching it. This is an image that came up in Google's Gemini when uh, it was asked to give an image of the Pope. So it brought out two images of the Pope. There was a black Pope and there was a woman, a lady as a Pope. Now, both of these don't exist. In the history of the Catholic Church, 273 popes. So the Pope is the head of the Catholic Church and there has never been a black Pope and women can't become a Pope according to the Catholic Church. So this is definitely, this was definitely a wrong thing. How did AI come up with this? So was it wishful thinking? Somebody asked for a photo of Mona Lisa. You are all aware of the famous smile of Mona Lisa. And AI came up with an image of Mona Lisa, which had a moustache and sunglasses. Uh, a lot of these uh, software today say we do not want AI generated images. What happens to painters and artists and uh, <coughs> sketchers if AI generates all the images? Do you think a painter, a portrait painter would go out of business? Do you think there would be nobody on the street creating graphic art? Even the graffiti that you see on the walls uh, is created by somebody who has that creative uh, uh, that talent in him or her. So what does AI do to all of these? 
and a, 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 a slide putting together AI tools for some miscellaneous things. So what you can definitely use, I would suggest is use Grammarly. Grammarly corrects the English for you, corrects the grammar and punctuation and it suggests changes to make it more correct English like. Grammarly is something you can definitely use. I also like goblin tools. So sometimes uh, many of us are very stressed because we have too many things to do. And if someone's told you to do a project, it is very confusing and it stresses you and you don't get sleep at night because you're thinking, how am I going to do this? Now, Goblin Tools breaks down your task for you. Sometimes, say for example, you need to make a cup of tea. Even that is stressful, isn't it? Goblin tasks will break down this making a cup of tea into different things. It will tell you what do you need? What are the ingredients? Uh, this is the process. Have you uh, filled a pan with water? Have you? Do you have the tea leaves ready? Do you have the sugar ready? Do you have the milk ready? So it becomes easier for a person to make that cup of tea. I'm just giving you the example of a cup of tea. But if you think of complex projects in your workplace, maybe three months, six months, yearly projects, all those reports that you need to give to the government, uh, governmental bodies, accreditation, uh, rules and regulations, all of those things are sometimes complex and they stress us out. Things like goblin tools are helpful in that uh, case and obviously originality is something like a plagiarism checker so something oh, like uh, turn it in <laughs> deep l is a very yeah. good translator so for example if there was a really good paper but it was in chinese and you wanted to read it you could use google translate but you could also use deep l There are, I think, more than 300 AI tools that I found and growing. Every time you look for a list of the top 10 tools, every day they will change. And every day there will be other tools taking its place. Uh, lots of AI tools are made by large corporations. Lots of them are developed by very specific individuals for very specific tasks some of them get merged together some of them uh, maybe just die out but to remember that this thing is growing Infosys has come up with something called nice which is something to look at and Amazon has come out with something called bedrock but there's also something to create your powerpoint for you which is called slides AI which is something to look at So how can I use AI tools in my research? Can I use AI? Can you as uh, teachers allow your students to use AI? How do you know whether your students are using AI? Believe me, my students tell me if you create an essay in AI and then if you put it through three different software, even turn it in cannot find out that it is AI generated. Then as teachers, as lecturers, how can you check that the work that your students have submitted is actually your own work? And as students, it would be very easy to use AI and probably pass the exam. But at the end of your uh, education, uh, what have you gained? Have you learned anything in the process or have you just excelled at using an AI tool? These are things to think about. Uh, in the background of all this, there is also this thought that AI is here to stay. And the more you tell your students don't use AI, the more they're going to use it. Also, like an ostrich, you cannot put your head buried in the sand, but you need to be aware of what's happening around us. When computers came in many years ago, people said computers are going to replace humans. And so we don't need computers. Today, if you even go to update your passbook at a bank, they'll tell you to put it through a machine which will <coughs> automatically update it for you. 
if you don't know those small things about how to use the technology, you're going to be left behind. I, I would suggest we learn about it, but we also learn the advantages and disadvantages. As teachers, we teach our students. And as students, we probably help our colleagues, but learn for ourselves what we can and can't do with an AI tool. I'm looking at it through a very critical lens, but I've got some links. And if you want to take a photograph of this slide and you want to then go and look at that link, there's Dr. Beth who says, look at AI like a friend you can't trust. You know, in this group of friends that we have, there will always be one friend whom you can't trust. That is AI. Today, AI is at the forefront. And if we think that we're going to lose our jobs to AI, it's not that we're going to lose our jobs to AI, but we are going to lose our jobs to other people who know about AI and who know more that, than us and who know how to update themselves. So that is something to think about. I'm just going to uh, end up with three slides that I have. Once about AI prompts. So what you are asking AI. So you can't just say, tell me about cars. But tell AI, tell me about a particular model, when it was created and where I can buy it from and what are its advantages and disadvantages. So if you narrow down your question and make it more focused, uh, the chances of you getting a better answer will automatically increase. This is something we constantly need to remember. Rem remember I said at the beginning that AI is actually created by humans or written by humans. So there is always bias. Do we say work men always and not work women? Do we think that nurses are always women? Do we think that managers are always men? Oh, that's, that's just a, a gender bias. There's also an occupational bias. Do we think in terms of skin color? And do we think people of a particular uh, race or ethnicity or geographical area only do certain things or their income is generally so much? There is a lot of bias in the world. And this bias does come into AI. The other thing is data privacy. When you are asking things to AI, AI remembers what you asked. So if I am asking something about, say, a particular political party and I'm constantly asking it back and forth, AI is forming an opinion about my political ideology, which is scary because this information is stored somewhere on the Internet and may or may not benefit you in the long run. So think about what are you sharing? What are you agreeing? Don't put in sensitive data. Don't, don't tell AI about your age or name or bank or uh, individual thoughts or things like that. Check uh, your privacy settings. Check. It always asks you, isn't it, about cookies. Do you want to accept all? You can decide whether you want to accept all there. Hallucination is something which is creating that which does not exist. So often you will have AI telling you that the, the temperature in London is 30 degrees today. But it is not. It's probably the temperature, I don't know, in India or another country. And AI is creating this based on your oh, questions you because you are asking for these things. So should humans review AI-generated work is a question that we need to think about. You don't just churn out an essay in AI and send it off to your teacher. Are you not reviewing what has been written? Are you not checking whether it's correct or no? All of this is things to think about. 
this is a classic example of chat gpt which invents academic papers so if you've seen there is a there are a couple of authors there is a year of publication there is a title there's also a journal as well as page numbers so it all looks perfect however it doesn't exist and we've done lots of these sort of experiments in chat gpt and we have found that chat gpt hallucinates or creates papers to please you it's like that little child who wants to please the father and says yes 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 i've done it all that's chat gpt so things to think about what you should do is ask ai tools for evidence can you provide the source use multiple prompts ask for explanations cross check this information uh, remember that the ai model is human made so there will always be bias how do you know that uh, all uh, women are nurses Is, are there male nurses uh, do you have any evidence in how many countries are uh, nurses male ask those questions to ai I've just put a couple of books that you can read, but uh, there is a lot more on the internet today. But uh, to think about how it's racist and how it might not be ethical and uh, to think how you need to be very critical when you are looking at AI. Question. Keep asking those questions because that's how you are going to get better as AI gets better. Just something to remember about chat GPT. I've just sort of break, broken it down into some examples. And I've said what it is about. So it's conversational, generative, pre-trained, and it is a transformer. And as I have put in some bits about how it helps the researchers, because you can ask it for a beginning. So I, I'll give you an example. I had a student, undergrad student, 18 year old who wanted to create a CV uh, and say, and came to me and said, ma'am, I have no experience. I haven't done anything, but I need a CV to apply for a job. So we went into chat GPT and we asked chat GPT and chat GPT gave us very good uh, keywords to begin with. Have you worked in a restaurant? Then you're good with inventory, you're good with budgets, you're good with customer service. Have you done any voluntary work in libraries? Then you are good in this, this, this. And you can put all of these words in your CV. So chat GPT does help you. You can start by asking chat GPT to create a CV for you. And I think that's a really good beginning point because it helps you to build on the skills which you might not have as well. But what AI tools cannot help researchers with is because they don't have emotional understanding. There is no empathy. Ask chat GPT in a very complicated childbirth. Do you save the mother or the child? Chat GPT will not have an answer to it. It says I don't have uh, any emotional understanding. I don't have opinions. If you ask chat GPT, are men better than women? Uh, do women make better managers? Uh, what Men as chefs, have they excelled? Uh, what are the predominant roles that women take? Chat GPT does not have that sort of, it might give you a lot of text, but it doesn't have that sifting or understanding that humans have. So things to think about. That's the base of it. You do need to do your referencing and your citations like I explained at the beginning. And I have a lot, if you want to get a photograph of this slide, I have a lot of uh, links that I have used during the preparation of this slide, but things that you can also uh, read about and uh, understand a lot of AI. Thank you for the opportunity and I hope that uh, you have enjoyed this session. Thank you. I'll yes, thank, thank you, you ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Artificial intelligence 
that is ai ai has emerged as a transformative force across various powerful tools that enhance efficacy accuracy and decision making but we should be aware of its disadvantages too so thank you so much ma'am for such an informative session and such a good presentation thank you so much ma'am it's my, my humble request to all the participants it's my humble request to all the participants to please switch on their cameras for a group photo with dr janis fernandez ma'am please participants switch on your cameras for one group photo with ma'am saba ma'am it's okay is it okay okay kindly do the screenshot i would like to uh, participants request you to make open your video on your video for the purpose of the nac uh, uh, what do we say uh, the proof please open your video sagarna vinanti ahe ki kalshekar college la nac enar teva he proof amala lagel tar tumcha video on karu theva please शाहिदा मैडम प्लीज डू द स्क्रीनशॉट please take the photo screenshot immediately yes sir please wait okay. i hope form of forward is going on yes it is done thank you should i continue yes please please, please okay. thank you so much okay now i would request shaista ma'am to continue with the session over to you shaista ma'am thank you so much uh, i'm shaistan sari and as to be marks a momentous occasion let's be gathered to honor the brilliance of academic inquiry and innovation it is with great sir please like send to... sir please send group in group group send please photograph a screenshot sir have you hearing you yes yes okay sir okay sir we will do that okay uh -huh. yes sir i have uh, uh, speak to you yes. photograph group sent in photograph we will send you group okay. not worry we will send you will okay send okay you. sir okay 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 sir shaisa ma'am you can continue ma'am please thank you it is with great reverence that i introduce a distinguished professor dr rajendra kumhar sir whose exemplary research has propelled our understanding of academics to new heights to brief up about dr rajendra kumhar sir he is presently working as professor and head at the renowned department of library and information science at the prestigious savitribai phule pune university he has been teaching to various courses in library science for more than 30 years to his credit he has over 70 articles published in national and international journals and conference proceedings he has published more than 20 books these books are published by national and international publishers reading research method and classification are the topics of his interest he has specifically written on these topics as a part of co curricular activities he has attended more than 100 conferences seminars workshops and presented papers chaired sessions and delivered keynote addresses he has delivered number of lectures on diverse topics at library and information science refresher courses at various universities he has been a member of various academic bodies such as bos academic council 
research and review committees, etc. He has guided seven doctoral research scholars as well. We extend a heartfelt welcome to our esteemed keynote speaker, Dr. Rajendra Kumhar, sir, and would request him to please address the conference, sir. Thank you, madam. Uh, I will request uh, for actually stop sharing your screen so that I can say, uh, share my screen. Uh, yes, sir. Hello, yes, sir. Sorry yes, sir. to please. interrupt you in between the session. Uh, yes, sir. Please I... continue. Kumar, sir, please continue. Hello. Can you hear me? Whatever the question will be asked, you ask the question after the ending session of the conference. Kumar, sir, please continue. Yeah. Okay. Shabha, madam, biota reading ho gaya na? Okay, okay. Thank you very much for a nice introduction. Uh, good morning, uh, participants, authorities of uh, A.E. Karsikar uh, College, uh, Dr. Kishore Vagmare, and dear participants. It is indeed my pleasure to be part of uh, this venture, a webinar uh, on uh, a multidisciplinary themes. I am uh, particularly interested to share some of my thoughts uh, with you about the national education policy and uh, more particularly the role of library in implementing national education policy. Friends, uh, we are all aware uh, in, as far as the Indian context is concerned that in 2020, the government of India has come up with a national education policy. Sometimes though we refer to it as a new education policy, though already actually almost about four years have been passed. Many universities in the nation and colleges have already started uh, uh, the courses restructured as per the national education policy. So my uh, intention to talk to you is actually what are the features of uh, national education policy and how the libraries across the institutions are helping the uh, institutions and the higher monitoring bodies like UGC to implement the national education policy more specifically, I am referring to all this with reference to uh, higher education, that is uh, colleges and uni universities. Though one part of uh, uh, national education policy is exclusively devoted to school education, uh, that I will not be actually uh, covering right now. Well, one of the focus there are many aspects which the national education policy focuses uh, as far as the higher education is concerned. One aspect it exclusively highlights is quality. Quality of universities, quality of colleges affiliated to universities. Look, the university education started in India almost 200 years back. And we have actually a wide network of universities and colleges, more than 300 universities, thousands of colleges. We have been fairly providing quality education. In spite of that, what do we notice is that there is still a huge scope for improving the quality. Quality of our curriculums, quality of our teaching, quality of our assessment, quality of infrastructure, so every aspect of it. And that is the reason the uh, UGC uh, through the national education policy is really uh, targeting for the improvement of policies. And that is the reason actually with the beginning of implementation of national education policy, all universities and colleges have revamped their curriculums. 
not just structurally, that is from three-year courses to four-year courses and so on and so forth. But when it comes to the courses and contents of those courses have really been made up to the mark of the current needs, that is one aspect. The national education policy really, really focuses on the another, uh, what you can say, pillar of the educational system, that is the faculty, the Ooh. teachers, the human resources. What the NEP exclusively mentions that we need to have motivated, energized, and capable teachers. Look at it. Because it believes that the motivated teachers will be able to actually motivate, encourage the students to come to the higher education arena and grasp the knowledge. Similarly, they have to be energized, ready to work tirelessly, and of course, they must be capable to deliver. See, as far as the teaching as a profession is concerned, as a, a, a job area is concerned, as a career is concerned, teachers have to have two abilities. One, a vast knowledge of the given subject area. And secondly, the ability to deliver it effectively. They have to have the ability to actually teach the subject in such a manner that the students with the lowest IQ is able to understand the subject. That is the capacity as far as the delivery system is concerned. The national education policy also does mean what they mean by capable that the teachers of the modern day must be able to use the technology to enhance the effectiveness of their teaching. That is another focus of the national education policy. And, and of course, the infrastructure. We all know that. In order to actually implement the national education policy, we have to have infrastructure in terms of uh, space, in terms of the technology, technologies, and of course, uh, in terms of the human resources, all that put together really makes our institution ready to impart quality education. Few more features of the National education policy with reference to higher education are that, yes, it is really promoting the distance and open learning. Yes, it was already there, actually, even before the national education policy's arrival. Uh, there were a number of courses, number of universities and colleges, they were offering distance education and open learning courses. But the NEP has put further focus because ultimately they want to actually enhance the scope of enrollment. They want more and more students to come to the higher education. They want an opportunity to be made available to them. They should not be deprived uh, from the uh, opportunities of higher education. That is why this is also another focus. Of course, uh, as I was just mentioning about it, they want to increase the gross uh, enrollment ratio. Look at that. That is the reason actually. They, the, right now we have got uh, the enrollment ratio somewhere around uh, 28, 29 and they want to have it uh, increased to 50% and maybe more than that. And uh, that focus will really uh, uh, have more opportunities for all educational institutions to have more and more learners coming to their institutions. As this conference is focusing on uh, multidisciplinarity and the national education policy too is uh, has all there as far as the promotion of multidisciplinarity approach is concerned. That is why actually if you look at the, uh, the core structure that has been suggested by the national education policy the empowering committee, 
they have said that there will be core papers and there will be actually the so called uh, uh, supplementary papers or the so called uh, uh, courses which will be uh, beyond the faculty uh, of the core papers now these uh, uh, optional papers will ultimately help you to have that uh, interdisciplinary multidisciplinary approach imbibed in the learners which will be learning under the uh, national education policy 2020 yes the nep is also actually uh, putting lot of efforts into uh, making learning with uh, active participation of students that is the reason actually the internship on job training has been made a compulsory component in the uh, national education policies structure so that students will not be only learning theoretically but whatever they will be learning they will be trying to do it so that is also a focus of the national education policy before i come to actually how the libraries uh, help in uh, implementing all these aspects uh, let me also have a cursory look at the remaining uh, features of the national education policy with reference to higher education that is equity inclusion and diversity yes it is so important as per as the nation like india is concerned that no segment of the society no individual of the society should be deprived of the opportunities of higher education that is why every citizen every child every youth of the nation must have equal opportunity every segment must be included in the uh, flow of the higher education and uh, 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 every aspect is the word that diversity is maintained uh, yes uh, look at it while uh, admitting students while designing courses while providing services everywhere we have to actually attain to these features what nep is uh, trying to buy also another feature if you uh, go through the whole document of national education policy is the uh, focus of using indian languages already as far as the school education is concerned the nep insists that the uh, primary education should be imparted in the uh, mother tongue in the local languages because uh, that learning is more okay. effective that is what is the education science okay. research okay. has confirmed but not just at the school level the nep does insist that even the higher education teaching learning process should be made available with the uh, indian languages so courses like engineering and medical apart from of course art science uh, commerce uh, should be made available in the indian language that is one of the focus so uh, we have to ensure as far as the quality component is concerned this language aspect also must be kept in mind the another important feature of the nep is that the uh, doctoral research students is a special focus on that uh, students who will be enrolling for the phd programs or doctoral research the nep uh, makes it compulsory that those students have to opt for courses in education uh, pedagogies and even writing related courses the benefit of opting for these courses by the doctoral research scholar is that they after getting doctoral degree will be automatically be equipped for these types of activities also that is teaching learning and that is the reason the nep has linked the doctoral research along with the teaching and pedagogies and even writing creative writing also one last point 
as far as the features of uh, NEP is concerned, that yes, it has focused on adult education and lifelong learning. Reason being, learning is a lifelong process. We keep on learning as human beings till the last breath of our life. If that is the case, there should be opportunities made available irrespective of your age that you want to learn and there is an opportunity. That is why the NEP has a separate segment devoted for adult education as well as for the lifelong learning. Friends, uh, this was just a, a glance through though each of those points need to be uh, elaborated, deliberated for hours together to have a complete picture of what do you mean by those points in the NEP. But the focus of my talk is not that. I, I, I want to actually talk about how the library has a super fine support system in terms of the NAC. Uh, library is referred to as a support system. How this support system helps educational institutions like colleges and universities to implement the NEP and there. Of course, uh, uh, I will be talking with reference to the features that I just elaborated and there the role of libraries. One important role. If you remember, the very first point was quality education. And what libraries are doing or they will keep on doing is making available varieties of printed sources. Friends, though we live in the what is called as an online word, a digital word, a technological word, and all those terms we do use. And uh, of course, we are being uh, in highly influenced by this technological word. In spite of that, research in reading, research in education, research in psychology, research in digital technology does tell us that the value of referring to and reading of printed reading material is extremely high. That doesn't mean that we should not use the digital literature or uh, electronic journals and electronic books. We must use it. I will be talking about that separate. The point right now I want to highlight is that what libraries have been doing for centuries together and that contribution is going to be continued in the digital world also that is making available varieties of documents in the printed form. Our libraries are pl plotted with printed material. There are high quality with comprehensive collections in the nation. And uh, what is that variety? See, by and large, we, 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 we are uh, aware only as far as libraries are concerned, we, we refer to those uh, as a student and maybe then in the academics as a teachers and then researcher. That's all, three roles, three stakeholders. As a student, we by and large come to know that there are textbooks in the libraries. As a teacher, so obviously, we come to know that apart from uh, uh, textbook, there are reference books and there are journals. As a research scholars, we may come to know apart from journals and rep uh, uh, reference books, there are other types of documents like thesis also. But friends, let me tell you, the word of uh, information sources available in the libraries is a great variety. There are hundreds of types of reference books themselves. Even if you refer to just uh, glossaries and dictionaries, when you are interested in having a true meaning of a word and all the flavors of those words, so as to use the same word in different contexts, I tell you, dictionaries are the best sources. If you want to have a detailed 10, 20, 30 pages consolidated information by uh, experts of the subject, Encyclopedias are the best sources, I guess. 
because of the technological influences, uh, our reading has become shallow. We are reading speedily and we are reading what is called with lot of distraction when we are reading digital. I tell you, to save ourselves from that shallow reading and uh, a distracted reading, go back to encyclopedias and read, get any cross that 20, 20, 20, 20 30, 40 pages on a topic put together by expert of the subject that is there. And of course, apart from that, the libraries have patents and standards and research reports. And of course, I tell you, the, the material, what is now being referred to as success literature or, a, or a, what is called as a self-help category books. Yes, print these books are published in great number in the modern time and they are read, consumed, I would rather say that, <laughs> in great quantity in the modern time. Self-help category books, personality development books. And I tell you, or maybe you can call it habit formation books. They really make you wise. Reading 10, 20 pages of these categories of books, they make you really wise by bringing to you experiences in story forms and uh, supported by data. It could be maybe books like uh, You Can Win and 5 AM Club and Atomic Habits and you have a series of uh, psychology of money and whatnot. I tell you, that is the, the power of libraries to really help in quality education. So uh, this value of libraries is unfortunately day by day is getting shadowed by the influence of the technologies. And uh, my appeal is that you make friends with the libraries, do visit every day at least one hour and you will be a totally changed personality uh, once you start visiting every day uh, for over a year, you will be a different person. Uh, I always say that reading and libraries uh, are change makers and that is the printed part. Well, as the UNEP is focusing on uh, education, local languages, uh, uh, and India has actually so many languages, every state has their own language. It is the library which really makes you available literature in the respective languages. Whether it is the, the, the uh, language like Marathi, Hindi, Urdu, Gujarati, Telugu, Malayalam, Telugu, whatever you call it. Look at it. There are people who are very deliberately coining appropriate terms in the regional languages, putting the contents together, creating contents with lot of papers and it is libraries who are making available. So, this is what I mean by supporting the uh, implementation of NEP by the libraries. How do they support? You want to impart education in the local languages and libraries make available the required reading material in those languages. That is their value. Of course, though I focused in the very first point that libraries do make available hundreds and thousands of volumes in the printed format and reading printed is so valuable. But my third point need not to be looked as a counterpoint of the first, but it is an extension of the first point. Yes, making themselves in tune with the modern world, modernizing and going along with the technological world, libraries have modernized themselves. Today's libraries are highly technological libraries and they do subscribe actually databases, large in number. And the speciality of databases is that one single database makes available thousands of journals, articles, hundreds of electronic books, lot many theses and even research reports. Look at the variety. And what these databases are further doing 
they are really, really adding value by number of features like simple and advanced search. By using appropriate keywords, you will be able to find the relevant piece of information from those large quantities of articles, books, and chapters from books, and so on and so forth. So search is one of the, and that search has been enabled and that has been further improved upon something called advanced search where you use, use Boolean operators and or not proximity search where you are ultimately being enabled to find the most relevant piece of information from the oceans you can say. Apart from that, the feature of the database which ultimately strengthens the learner, of course, the teacher and the researcher also. How? Once you start searching in the database, the retrieval will come always in terms of thousands and lakhs. How many items are retrieved? Great number, huge number, number beyond management. What the database technology is doing? The database technology enables you to filter it out by years, by geographical area, by uh, authors, by publishers, and so on and so forth, actually. By form of document, like you want PDF, you want HTML format, you want uh, what is called actually a, uh, a article published in a particular journal, so on and so forth. Isn't that great? And how the libraries are really helping the distance and open learners. Yes, there are many, many students who are doing their courses through MOOCs. In that case, the libraries are making available literature through remote access mechanism. Yes, so that library really becomes wireless library so that the library overcomes the barriers of uh, time and distance. Anywhere, anytime, you can access the library. That is what is actually the role of library in successful implementation of NEP because NEP expects a lot from every stakeholders, be it students, be it teachers, be it the administrators, actually, in the education system. Everybody should perform to the best possible extent. And remember, at the backbone of their performance is basically information, knowledge. And that support, that active support, that quality support is being brought by the libraries and there they really uh, enable. Uh, when it comes to the databases themselves, uh, we have to look at it from a very wide perspective that yes, there are paid databases and there are many, many databases even made available free of cost. Yes, you can access them without paying anything. A database like Google Scholar, yes, it is both. A, a search mechanism and as well as a database that makes you available free content. It's fantastic, I tell you. Every person who is associated with higher education must have a complete familiarity with Google Scholar. And it is the librarian and the library staff and the libraries, they are trying to actually create this literacy about these sources like Google Scholar or maybe the directory of open access journals, DOAJ in short it is called. Friends, this DOAJ has more than 15,000 journals and these journals are available for free access. You can search, you can browse, and you can download any article from any journal that is forming part of the OAJ. How great is that? And it is across the world, across the discipline. 
you may be a student or teacher or researcher of any subject, any discipline. You have access. You need not to even have a user ID and password. Unlike that, there are so many resources in the modern day being made available by the respective philanthropic mindsets. So there is no dearth of literature. But the what is called as the uh, uh, gate there, the access point remains the library because the library professionals are masters of information sources and they will be able to channelize you. They will be able to take you to the appropriate sources. And that is actually as far as the uh, uh, resources like databases, distance learning, and enabling anyone everywhere, any place, 24 by 7 learning, that is actually the library's role in implementing the uh, national education policy. Yes, friends. As I was just talking about the literacy programs, how libraries are trying to actually help in the implementation of NEP. When there are huge resources available, either paid or subscription based, they will be used conditionally. You are aware of them. Yes, that awareness, that familiarity is so essential. In the absence of that, very useful resources may not be used at all. And that is why the every library is conducting information literacy programs, library orientation program, database awareness program, OPAC search programs, and number of activities. Continuously, libraries are making effort to create that literacy so that our users, they may be students, teachers, researchers, so that they are able to know what are the varieties of sources available, how to assess those sources for by applying quality parameters, because when a huge number of sources are created, sometime quite possible there may be a, a low quality resources, there may be fake resources. So the libraries do train you as users. They do impart that literacy so that you are capable to assess, evaluate, download, search. Because searching is actually a, a, an exercise, I tell you. It takes a lot of time. It rather kills your time. And at the end of it, not necessarily you will be able to have what you are expected to find. So there, those libraries are really actually trying to create literacy. Libraries are using actually the uh, uh, digital technology to a large extent. And uh, they are also trying to familiarize the user so that all those technological uh, uh, infrastructures created in libraries should be used optimally. And for that purpose, these awareness programs are so important Every library is making their utmost efforts to create that awareness. And that is what the information literacy program is part of that. And a number of uh, college librarians, university library professionals, they are trying for that. What is more important is that the libraries are making available quality space. Yes, space is a great resource in the modern time, particularly when it comes to serious study, reading and research. You need actually what is called as a, a peaceful place to read, to digest the content that has been uh, read by you. Not just that, students and researchers require space to deliberate, to discuss, because the collaborative learning, gone are the days actually when libraries were considered as places where uh, you had to uh, always put uh, your fingers on your mouth, not to speak. 
not to utter a word, don't make any sound. But you know, with the educational uh, uh, thought, where it has been researched that the collaborative learning, discussions based learning, deliberative learning is very useful. And if that is the case, libraries must make available spaces for the discussions also. And many libraries are making available what they call as a discussion rooms for students, maybe even for faculties. What is the benefit of that? Yes, the library space then becomes a quality space for those discussions. Not just that. Nowadays, libraries are also looked as maker space. Maker space means a space that is used for creating something, making something. Yes. Why this has been considered as a maker space? Because the group of uh, researchers who is interested to create something innovative, they may come to the library, start thinking, and their thinking need to be supported by appropriate literature. The library staff will make available in the flow of discussions required document where those discussions will become further more qualitative. And as a result, they will come out with something concrete as a product, as an idea. That is the reason today's libraries are considered as maker space where you can use those libraries for this particular purpose. Friends, if you look into those every points of a, a good curriculum, see, how do we actually create good curriculum? Unless we as teachers, as curricular makers, as a board of study members, have information about what is going around the globe. So the best thing where the NEP does support, the libraries does support in implementation of NEP, through what? The curriculums can be uh, made qualitative. Conditionally, you have appropriate supportive information at the uh, uh, juncture, at the point where you are really being uh, joined in a meeting. They do that. So is the case when it comes to actually creating content. Yes, NEP does expect that. Every teacher should create content, maybe in the form of swayam, maybe in the form of video lectures. Friends, remember that to create a video lecture on a particular topic of a very influential nature, you need to have as a backbone appropriate information. Maybe history of the topic, maybe the current status of the topic, maybe the ongoing project of the topic, maybe the illustrative information on the topic. Anything that is related with the topic on which you are interested to create a, a video lecture, that is what you mean by creating content. I tell you, there the libraries do really come provide a complete information support by making available appropriate reading material. We did talk about actually the so-called energetic capable teachers. Yes, I always believe that teachers are made over the years. We are not born as a teacher. When you join the teaching profession, gradually you improve upon your teaching skills and your stock of subject knowledge. Friends, remember here, Again, it is the library. If the NEP means to have actually capable, energetic, enthusiastic teachers as a need of the national education policy, the role of libraries in making those qualities, imbibing those qualities or creating those quality teachers, capable teachers, I tell you, it is only by the library support because they can Put in your hand the exact document that will help 
you support, help you in getting those qualities. Coming to the research. Yes, the NEP has created the National Research Foundation and uh, a seed capital has been given and uh, through that, of course, not just they want to have interdisciplinary research, but they want to have quality research. They want to increase the segment of the research also. That is why even they have made it possible through the new structural change that uh, a, uh, a, a student after having a four-year research degree, uh, is uh, 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 he can now take admission for a doctoral research, so on and so forth. <clears throat> But all in all, as far as the research is concerned, you, the NEP does mention that the, the research has to be of a quality one. The research must result into producing good quality product, helpful for enhancing the quality of human life, creating peaceful societies, creating thinkers. And not just that, the research should be useful for making policies. Now, if you want to have such type of research which ultimately will enhance the quality of life, human life, that is possible again when the inputs are of a quality nature. Every piece of information may be available anywhere in the world that is made available by the library. This is what is there. One last point I would like to actually highlight is that as far as the creative writing is concerned. Yes, libraries and particularly libraries in the higher education friends are not just supporting your academic ventures. They are doing that, no doubt about it. You want to have a quality education, impart teaching learning, good quality teaching learning, libraries are there helping. Good research, they are helping. But apart from that, they are also helping to create a good human being, which is an ultimate goal of any educational system. How do they do that? That is by making available the literary work, biographies, and self-help category books. Every educational institution in the higher education system too has, and if not, they have to have at least about 30% of their collection belonging to these category of books. Fictions, novels, stories, poems, essays, and uh, of course, biographies and autobiographies. Look at that. A biography like Steve Jobs' autobiography. Does it really make change in the human being, in the learner, in the students? Does the biography of Dr. Abdul Kalamji encourages to have those wings of fire just creates that great willpower. A, a biography which will ultimately 